Welcome, everybody, to the first Sleeper Wire show of the 2019 season. Glad to be kicking it off here in January. I am Professor Chris, and with me today, the wonderful Dirty Jobs Mike. How's it going, dude? Man, it is going good. It's it's sad at the same time. I mean, I'm not happy yet because football season basically is over. I mean, right, we got playoffs and stuff like that, but... Is it just me, or is football kind of boring when you don't have fantasy going on? <laughs> Not for Colts fans, man. Oh, yeah. Not for any teams in the playoffs. I guess, yeah. Maybe that's because I'm a Broncos fan that yeah. I have such disdain for the playoffs this year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we do have some exciting news for the Broncos that we'll get to here in just a second. But guys, welcome back to the next season of the Sleeper Wire show. It's going to be a good one. We got some great things going on this season. We're not going to reveal all of them yet. You know, it's it's only episode one, but it's going to be a fun season. We're happy to get it kicked off here. We've got a lot of coaching uh, changes to start with. Yeah, I mean, it's been kind of getting a good shake up going on. It's kind of funny that you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure, as you're seeing a lot of these guys getting pulled to other teams real quickly, you know. I mean, we got McCarthy, who doesn't look like he's coming back, but it seems like there's a lot of moving pieces still with a lot of these coaches. It's It's been pretty crazy. It's going to be really crazy to see, like, what kind of dynamic they bring to the team. And the biggest news, you know, probably for the AFC anyway, was Marvin Lewis finally getting fired after what 16 seasons with the Bengals and you have in the notes here that he is retiring now yep he's uh according to everything I saw he was stepping down I never actually saw anything that said he was fired but it was time man it was time years ago they have so much talent on that team and they just can't seem to get anything done with it this really excites me for Joe Mixon this really excites me for AJ Green next year it should be a whole different team Marvin Lewis was fired, for what it's worth. Okay, yeah. See, and yep. I, I just was going by the notes I had right there. And ev- everybody was shocked that oh, wait they didn't keep him again for no good reason. <laughs> <laughs> everybody uh, in the AFC was happy to see Marvin Lewis coaching the Bengals, especially in the AFC North, where it was basically a free win with Marvin Lewis as the head coach. Jets saw what Adam Gase did to the Dolphins last year and said, you know what? I think we want a piece of that. Adam Gase, head coach of the Jets now. What do you think about that? I, I think that'll be a, an improvement. I think that team's got, to me, it's trending up. I mean, they're, they've got a long ways to go before they're there. You get a couple good pieces, and I mean, this is the team that might pick up Le'Veon Bell. So I think this might be a good coaching change. I think this will be an improvement for the Jets. Yeah, there's a very good chance that Bell goes there. They do have the money to bring him in. Yep, absolutely. So do you think Gase would be more successful with the Jets than he was with the Dolphins? I think that it's almost, to me, is it seems like the same scenario, right? You kind of have a team that just isn't quite fully developed, but the Dolphins really should be there. I mean, they have veterans on their team uh, as far as veterans are concerned, right? I mean, you've got Devontae Parker, who's been supposed to be something for years, Tannehill, who's supposed to be something for years, and, I mean, just not doing anything with it. So you at least have some younger talent with uh, Sam Darnold and things like that out there. So I think he might actually be a little bit more successful. I think this uh, might be a little bit more to his play calling, not having Tannehill out there. All right. And, yeah, Ryan Tannehill did have a lot of promise at one point. You know, I think it was – oh, I forget what season it was. Maybe the – 2015 season where he finished as the quarterback 11 he had potential right and i mean it just it just seems to me like the nfl caught up to him as opposed to he doesn't have weapons or anything like that because i feel like Kenyon drake's a good runner i feel like Devonte parker kenny stills i think danny amadola i think all those guys are great receivers so i mean if you're not getting it done with that kind of an action i mean it all boils down to the quarterback play to me and it's not the coaching. I think Adam Gase is a good coach, and I think he'll actually not – I mean, you're not going to look at him. They're not going to win the Super Bowl next year or anything crazy like that. But he'll be able nope. to develop that team into something with the pieces that he has in place right now. I mean, Sam Darnold coming back next year, I think that ought to be a really good thing with him as with him under Gase. Could be a good match. I think you're just partial to Gase because of the Broncos. 
A little bit, little bit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've always, I've always admired him as a coach, and I just feel like he kind of got a, a bad rap with Dolphins. It's just they should be good. I mean, the Dolphins on I mean, paper should be a good team. Gase had Peyton Manning. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, that doesn't that, affect. That'll anything, make any does offensive it? coordinator look good. Oh yeah, that's true. Huh? <laughs> Let's move on. Freddie Kitchens has been promoted by the Browns from offensive coordinator to head coach. And you know what they say? Bakers love kitchens. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it's that's pretty neat. Cheesy. I think that that's cheesy, but that's even more kitchen references, right? <laughs> <laughs> But to me, I mean, like, I think he did great. He was he was the interim head coach for the second half of the season, and he looked good, man. I, he's going to turn that team around. They they started winning football games with him. Yeah, that's when the Browns are playing their best. Yep. Yeah, it's they're going to be fun to watch. They won about as many games as I expected them to this season, so that was really good to see. And, yep, so Freddie Kitchens to the Browns, we like that move. Baker Mayfield certainly likes that move. They're going to be a fun team to watch next season, which – you know, two years ago, saying that about the Browns is not something you would have heard coming out of our mouths. Let's talk about your team, though, Mike. Vic Fangio, Denver's head coach now. He was a defensive coordinator for the Bears this season, putting together that monster defense. You think this is going to be good news for Vaughn Miller and Bradley Chubb? I do. I'm really excited about this move right here because Denver's defense is already tough. And now that you're going to have this mastermind leading the team, I'm pretty excited to see what he can do. I mean, look what Chicago did. And, I mean, he, look what Chicago's been doing. He developed that defense. He's going to come into, like you said, Von Miller, Bradley Chubb. You just got so many weapons on that defense. So, I'm a little curious just to see what he can do as an offensive coach. But, I mean, if you've got a great defensive mind, it's just proven throughout history. The great defensive minds in football are always the better coaches. They're always the guy who win those Super Bowls. So I'm pretty excited to see what he can do. Hopefully we can get a good quarterback. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I mean, Case Keenum, a lot of Broncos fans are excited about that. He was certainly not the answer. And really, it's perfectly fine for a very strong defensive coach to be the head coach because all he has to do is hire a great offensive coordinator. Bring in one of those guys. He doesn't have to become a great offensive mind or anything. Bring in a great offensive coordinator, and boom, Denver's back in the playoff conversation. Yes, I love it. Matt LaFleur is now the head coach of the Packers. He was the offensive coordinator for the Titans last year in a very poor offense. As we've talked about plenty, Mike McCarthy is, you know, he's been fired from Green Bay for a while. He is going to have the 2019 season off, which probably means nobody wanted him. Right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> oh, yeah. This is voluntary. Sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's tough to think that people didn't want him because he came from such a legacy of coaching. But at the same time, I'm kind of with you. I think money would talk to anybody. And I don't think anybody offered this guy any money. So he's like, well, I'm going to take 2019 off. It wouldn't surprise me if we didn't see him not come back as like, say, an offensive uh, coordinator, a quarterback's coach, something like that capacity but I, I really wouldn't doubt that we don't ever see him in a head coaching position again yeah absolutely cardinals have brought in cliff kingsbury to be their head coach he was the head coach at texas tech for the last six seasons and went 35 and 40 how do you go 35 and 40 at a major college like that and then an nfl team was like yeah you know what we like you right <laughs> less than 500 and he's going to a less than 500 team yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that this is the move that they would make. I mean, didn't they have Bruce Arians as their coach for two years ago? And now he's going to be going elsewhere. It's just crazy to me because this guy obviously can't cut it in the college level. I don't know what makes you think he's going to be able to cut it at the NFL level. But, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there, all kinds of pieces that people can put together that get paid a whole lot more than we do to try to figure this stuff out. Maybe they just saw something in this guy's method, methods or something to that effect where they were like, hey, this is our guy. But it does seem kind of like it, they're just continuing to want to self-destruct to me. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to watch, but I don't think this was a great hire. Yeah, I mean, on paper, it definitely doesn't look like it, that's for sure. Give no, it, we'll I mean, have to, certainly something to monitor, though. Yeah, Texas Tech, I mean, they do have a very tough schedule year in and year out. Still, to me, I'm like, you think you'd be able to offer somebody else that has a winning record money. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I, 
Oh, one would think. Well, let's get to our last coaching changes here. Bruce Arians to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers comes out of retirement to be the head coach of the Bucs, and Todd Bowles is going to be his defensive coordinator. Yeah, that's going to be something. I think Bruce Arians to the Buccaneers, that kind of, it sucks because I do this every single season. I fall into a Bucs offseason hype, and I get all excited, and now that Bruce Arians is a coach there, I mean, man, I'm pumped. Like, I'm going to be high on uh, – Barber next year. I'm going to be high on Evans. I'm going to be high on Jameis Winston. Just all as a direct result of this, because I've always liked Bruce Arians as a coach. Yeah, he's done great wherever he's been. I mean, he was great in Arizona. He was really, really good for the Colts in that one season that Chuck Pagano had to take off, which was a huge bummer that the Colts had to let Arians go and not fire Pagano. I mean, you can't fire a guy right after he beats cancer, you know? Right. Like, <laughs> I understand right. why they didn't do it. But business-wise, it was not smart to let Bruce Arians go. Yeah. Yep, that is that is just the victim of circumstance right there. But, yeah, I've always been a really big fan of this, guys. Yeah, yeah. And so it's glad to see him back in the league. He's always been a fan of the vertical passing game. So Chris Godwin and Mike Evans next season, look out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, we're going to be right back. Here's an exciting new show that we've got coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Let's get ready to rumble! Guys, welcome to the introduction to the Fantasy Football University. It's going to be a little bit of a different show. I got my co-host from Break from the Grind, George Geo Reed, and I got our buddy Mike Dirty Jobs from the Sleeper Wire Show. We're going to be doing a beginner's fantasy football podcast. There's all kinds of podcasts out there for the go- for those of you that know what you're doing. You know them, I know them. We listen to them every day. What there isn't is a show for the people who have no idea what's going on. Do you have that person in their le- in your league that draft a kicker early or think defense and fantasy football wins championships? This is a show for him or her. Guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you think this show is going to be? Okay, so first off and foremost, we got, we're got going to be taking a new person, somebody completely new to the game, has somewhat of an understanding of football, somewhat of an understanding of how the game is played and has heard of fantasy football but has never actually taken part in fantasy football. So what we're going to do, we're going to turn around and we're going to turn them into a champion. We're going to take them from step one, the draft, to all the way through to the end. But first, we're going to get her ready. We're going to get everything going where she's prepared for that very first draft, where she has a strategy going into it. It's, it's going to be neat because we're going to be learning this all over again, and it's going to be a good time. Yeah, we're, we're all in those leagues where there's that one or two people who, like Mike mentioned, they, you know, they follow football, but they've never really done fantasy football. This is the show for them. Uh, we're not, we'll get into some metrics, but we're not going to get into like way advanced metrics. That's, that's not us. That's not what we want to do for this particular show. Uh, we're not going to break down, you know, the Monday night games, the, the Sunday day, the games, Thursday games. We're not going to break those down. That's other shows on the Super Wire Network. We are strictly focused on those beginners who, like Jason mentioned, they feel they need to fill out their entire roster before they focus on their bench. They think that because the quarterback scores the most points, that's who they need to draft for in the first round or the second round or the third round. We're here to guide that type of person, that type of individual, to a fantasy championship. And like Mike, Mike mentioned, we've got a, a young lady who's going to be coming on. She's going to be with us. She's never played fantasy football before. She follows you know, football a little bit, but she's never done the fantasy stuff before. We're going to take her from a novice to a championship. That is the goal. Uh, we're going to run her through the fantasy football university and make her a champion. So we've got 
we've got lesson plans, we've got quizzes, we've got tests, but you know what else we have? Because we're members of the, the Sleeper Wire uh, network, we've got Mock Metal Mondays, where you guys will be able to teach her during the mocks. You guys can be part of her education. We've Everybody got, needs classmates. Yeah, every, you, you, uh, Sleeper Wire has now become a big old classroom where everybody and listen class sizes it's up to you we've got we've got uh mail sack we've got sunday morning blitz we've got all the sleeper wire shows to help her out and she's going to be part of a program so when when she goes through the university her second semester is during the season and we're going to get her a championship against some of the pros and we're even going to sneak her into a couple of her own home leagues people unsuspecting not knowing anything, do do do. Here's this girl that comes in out of nowhere with just draft strategy after draft strategy, bailouts. I mean, we're talking everything you need to know to get you through these drafts. And then she's gonna just go in there, and if it's a lax league where you don't have a lot of people paying attention, it's gonna be complete domination. So very exciting stuff ahead. Very exciting stuff. So guys, uh, this is coming in the off season. If you want to reach out to us on Twitter, we're at FF underscore university. If you want to catch us on our Gmail, it's fantasyfootballuniversity at gmail.com. And soon to have a website, Fantasy Football University. Enjoy a short fantasy football break. Class will be in session soon. And go FFU. All right, guys. Make sure to tell anyone you know who's wanting to get into fantasy football to follow these guys at FF underscore university. Let's get back into it. Let's move to a couple things to remember for next season. And Mike, you came up with a couple of these, so I'm going to kick it to you. Okay, so this is just kind of like a time capsule of sorts, something that we're going to refer to back maybe at the beginning of the next season just to kind of refresh our brains on a few things. Because six months off, it it just – you forget. You forget about certain things. You start falling into hypes. You start looking at – different kind of things that are coming up and you draft the wrong people. This is why we all picked up Leonard Fournette this year. I mean, Leonard Fournette has proven an injury history and he just proves that this is a guy that's going to destroy you. Things like that. I mean, and we'll get to him here in a few minutes because I have a few things to say to Leonard Fournette, but we're going <laughs> to go ahead and kick this off with Le'Veon Bell. Now, his landing spot will be the decisive factor in where he can be drafted, which, duh, right? Like, if this guy goes to, let's say, Cincinnati, for instance, although that wouldn't make any sense, but let's just say for argument's sake he went there to that dumpster fire of a team that it was this year, right? You're not going to want this guy in the top 12. So, he's expected to be a Jet, and in my opinion, like, if he's on the Jets, that's going to be another one of those teams where I feel like Le'Veon Bell is going to have to fall out of the top 12. He's a fantastic running back, right? But a lot of that running back comes from his effectiveness to be able to run the football. I mean, all I'm saying is this guy is not going to deserve the the draft that he's going to get next year because people are going to put him back in the top five conversation right at the beginning of the season just because of his talent. But that's just a huge product of Pittsburgh. I'm telling you, we don't know what Le'Veon Bell's like Without, I mean, you can drive a semi through their holes, a semi through them. So don't get caught up on Le'Veon Bell. What do you think? Like, where is your ideal landing spot? And you can't say Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm glad you said that because I saw this stat that compared Marlon Mack from week six to the end of the season. If you look at that span of games, those 10 games or so, Marlon Mack had the fourth most rushing yards. Oh, wow. This was the prove it season for Marlon Mack, and I think he proved it. And I'll I'll admit, at the beginning of this season, I kept saying, you know what? I hope the Colts draft Nick Chubb, or I hope the I hope Barkley falls to the Colts at number three, and then they traded back to number six. So I knew they weren't going to get him. But was, all right, we can't get Barkley, get Nick Chubb. It turned out that they made – Fantastic draft picks with Quentin Nelson and Darius Leonard, who's been a monster. But I thought Marlon Mack was not the answer at running back, and I was way wrong on that. Marlon Mack is a stud. He is perfect for that offense. Naheem Hines is a perfect complement for him, like Darren Sproles type back. And Jordan Wilkins wasn't 
special by any means, but he proved that he can spell Marlon Mack and still be effective. He's a bigger guy. He can grind out those two or three yards on like third and one if he has to. He's doing exactly what they need him to do for his specific skill set. So honestly, I don't, as much as I would love to have Lev Bell on the Colts, they don't need him. They have a ton of cap space. I would love to see them sign a couple huge free agent linemen. I think that would be really big for the Colts this offseason. Yeah, I think if you give them a couple of linemen, man, that's just going to be lights out. I think that's going to be another Super Bowl contender right there because they were, I mean, they looked good. They looked really good this year. There was a few. And the the defense was really good for most of the season, too. I mean, they were playable in fantasy for at least half the season. I know I played them in fantasy quite a bit in a bunch of leagues. And the offense, you know, once they started clicking, I mean, they went one in five to finishing as a 10 and six team. Yeah. Like they have been hot and a lot of fun to watch. Like they are clicking now. And Chester Rogers is the wide receiver, too. Yeah, Chester Rogers has definitely separated himself on that team for sure. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, like, look at what Luck has had to work with and look at how great he's still done. Eric Ebron, that signing, man, Chris Ballard knows what he's doing. Right. Great offense, great GM. How many people were on board with Eric Ebron in the offseason, by the way? Like, everybody's like, oh, his hands suck. Man, if you picked him up, and it was crazy because I had him in so many leagues, even though I talked so much trash on him. I had him in so many leagues, and just, wow, just dominant, man. He looked so good this year. He's to be fair, be... I did watch him drop a bunch of passes, right. <laughs> especially key passes, but he caught the the most important ones. Right. It's crazy. What, what uh, tight end do you think he's going to drop next year? You know, I think he's probably going to be drafted in the top six, even with Doyle back. Yeah, I agree. I think he'll go way ahead of Doyle, in fact. Yeah, and at this point, I think he should. Right. Well, I don't know. I feel like I might be picking up Doyle late. That's another guy I'm kind of high on already for next year. So getting back to things not to forget, uh, Bears offense. Now, the Bears offense is something that I watched very closely this season just because I watched their defense closely last season. And I'm like, man, these guys are just a couple big pieces away from really being lights out. I mean, if you remember last season, they lost – a lot, but they lost a lot of their games by like, you know, two, three points. Their offense just couldn't quite keep them in the game. I feel like this is going to be a breakout year for Mitchell Trubisky. I think you're going to have Allen Robinson. I mean, I think you're going to have an awakening on that offense because when you're on the field for as long as this team has the tendency of being, you just, you have no choice to, but to almost get good at what you're doing. I mean, you're a professional. You're in the top 99% as it is. So, it's not hard to translate that into plenty of playing time with all your players. I think the Bears offense is going to be something to watch and something that I'm really excited about, I think the most excited about throughout the situation is the ADP that these guys are going to bring. Like, I'll bet you Allen Robinson's going to be like a 35 to 40, somewhere in there. Jordan Howard, same thing. Anthony Miller, another guy that I'm kind of excited. And so Trey Burton's another guy that I've got my eyeballs on because now he's had a year to develop. I At the beginning of the season, I said it. Everything is new to this team. That does not bode well for a tight end. But Trey Burton's a great tight end, and he can catch the football. And now you're going to have a whole other offseason with him. That defense isn't going anywhere almost. So I think that the Bears' offense is something to watch. What do you think? Uh, I'm not as excited about it as you are. Uh, I will say that Trubisky did much better than I thought he was going to do. I do think he is going to be drafted as a starting quarterback next season. Now, I'm not saying he's going to go in like the top eight or anything like that for quarterbacks, but someone is going to draft Trubisky as a starter. They're going to believe in him. I actually like Anthony Miller the most out of the wide receivers there. See, and I think like after that last game I was watching and it just looked like Allen Robinson was the man. I've always been kind of an Allen Robinson guy, so I might be a little bit biased on that. Because, But I like Anthony Miller. I'm also a Taylor Gabriel fan. I mean, these guys have some pretty severe weapons. and I, just, I'm, I think they're just about two clicks away from putting it all together. Not to be all Nick about it or anything like that, because I don't really <laughs> like the Bears that much. I just really like the potential that they have for fantasy. And Trubisky, that's going to be a guy I'm probably going to be drafting in the 15th, 16th round next year if I can get away with it. 
Ah, he's not going to fall that far. He might not. So, so I have like a ten round caveat for my for my quarterbacks next season. Like, it's if it's not tenth round or later, I'm not drafting him. Yeah, did, totally agree. I did too many shares of Carson Wentz this year. Carson Wentz, he'll be an absolute stud next year. I bet. I mean, the Eagles are not going to bring Nick Foles back. They've already said that. Yep, Carson Wentz, the future. He, as much as you want Nick Foles to be it, man, that guy is clutch in December and January though. But Remember, September, October is all I'll yep. say. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, he might be the only quarterback I think I'll thumbs up before round three. How about you? You know, he's not throwing 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns again. You know what? I'm just going to say this now, Chris, because it's crazy. But I feel like Patrick Mahomes can actually break that number next year. I mean, he definitely can. I'm not saying he can't. I think it's possible, and he's got the arm, and he's got the speed, and the you know the receiving talent on his team to do so. I will say, I would I would take Mahomes over Aaron Rodgers. I might. I think he is probably going to be the number one quarterback, and rightfully so. To me, this guy is like the Michael Jordan of football. Just the way he <laughs> plays, dude. It's it's the look, right? It's the Derek Jeter look that he has on his face when he just gets that, you know what, I'm going to hit a home run now. I don't care type thing. And you know how yeah, I feel Derek about Derek Jeter is so overrated. Oh, I hate Derek Jeter. At me on him. Twitter, everybody. Yep. Hashtag Professor Chris says Derek Jeter is overrated. <laughs> See, and I feel like he's probably one of the best players to play the game, so we're completely opposite on that. But, I mean, it's just the look that they have on their face when they get clutch. And Patrick Mahomes has that. I feel like he should be the number one. And again, he's the only quarterback I feel like I'll condone before round 10. Because everything else after that, this year taught me a lot about quarterbacks. Like the number one quarterback was, it was Patrick Mahomes, right? He came off undrafted in a lot of leagues because of his tough schedule at the beginning of the season. Matt Ryan, I believe he was number two, right? Yes, he was. Yeah, I mean, and Matt Ryan came off the board 13th or 14th. You know who came off first? Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers' team is a dumpster fire. And they do already kind of they did already kind of move some coaching stuff around there during the season and it just still was not clicking. They couldn't get anything going on that offense. I think Aaron Rodgers before the 10th round is crazy next year. But you're going to see him drop in 4th or 5th. I'm avoiding the guy. Matt Ryan, yeah. he's he's going to get hyped this year. What do you think? I think he's going to, and rightfully so. Rightfully so. He's got a good arm. He's got a good offense. But I think what's going to happen, unfortunately, is that's going to force his draft capital to be way too high for me to grab him now. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to draft him as the number two quarterback. Let me put it that way. Right. There's still – I would take Rodgers. I would take Luck. I would take Watson. Maybe Rivers. Those guys over Matt Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think – I think Rivers is another guy. Now, there's a lot of – there's always moving pieces, right? Like, Rivers could win the Super Bowl and decide to retire this year. Something crazy like that. But – yeah, I'm right there with you. This is just all early, early speculation, and I don't think we've stated that yet, so I feel like it's worth stating. This is just us kind of talking football, guys. We're not trying to predict anything. We're not trying to say that this guy's going to be this guy. We're just kind of calling him as we see him now because it always seems like we forget that Matt Ryan's a good quarterback. You know, things like that. We don't remember. He goes undrafted. He goes 14th, 15th. Things like that when the guy deserves a lot better. He deserves better than that, Chris. To be fair, I mean, after his MVP season, he was awful for fantasy. Yeah. But hey, who knew if you start throwing Julio Jones the ball in the end zone that you'll start succeeding? Julio yeah. Jones. Surprise, surprise, right? Did who? How did Julio Jones finish as wide receiver? Do you know? Wide receiver four. Wide receiver in, four. In PPR leagues. Yep. See, and I called him to have a career year and to be the number one receiver. So I fell short by about three on that one. That's why I asked. You fell short by 8.1 points. Wow. Yep. Wow. So in PPR, Tyreek Hill, 334, number one. 
DeAndre Hopkins, 333.5, so he was half a point back. Mm. Devontae Adams, 329.6, so he was 5.4 behind Tyreek Hill. And Julio, 325.9. So he was only 8.1 points away from being – you know, that that's only one 21-yard touchdown. Right. 11-yard touchdown in PPR. Like, that's it. That's all he was away from being the number one. Wow. That's pretty amazing right there. And it's good to see, like, Tyreek Hill leading that pack because, man, that guy's got so much talent. Yeah. So basically, you I mean, you were co- technically wrong, but not exactly wrong. <laughs> right. right. I mean, the guy did. He If you got him, you were happy you had him this year. Yeah. I mean, nearly 1,700 receiving yards. Jeez. 1677. Isn't that Jeez. ridiculous? That is ridiculous. He is so good at football, man. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of receivers, right, in keeper leagues, if you have Sanders, this is just something that's kind of a note, maybe just for me. But he's probably a droppable asset. I don't think he's going to play in 2019. It seems like that injury always takes about a year and a half or so. He got it late in the season. I don't know. What are you thinking here? I mean, I love me, Emmanuel Sanders. I love the connection he had with Case Keenum. But I think that nah, he's too old. Yeah. He's not coming Too back. old, horrible injury, not even dra- uh, draftable. Yeah, I don't believe he'll even be draftable next season. I completely agree with that, too. Nope. Leave, him on your, leave him on your dynasty bench if that's where you're sitting with him. That, that's a quick thing to remember. <laughs> yes. Yep, I just had to toss that in there just because I know there's going to be hype around him next year. He's going to get, well, if we get him in the 15th or 16th, it's worth waiting until week six. Well, he probably won't be back by week six. They'll just keep If he was 24, back. then maybe. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, back on another receiver. Remember Kiki Kuti next year. That guy is going to be the next Will Fuller. I think I think he's got the connection with Deshaun Watson. I think that offense is going to be a powerhouse next year. What do you think? Uh, it's going to be the second best in the AFC South. <laughs> That's awesome. How, how did I know uh, it was going to be a Colt style answer? Oh, <laughs> uh, I have to, man. I have to. It's the playoffs. I'm going to be biased. We're not talking about, you know, fantasy football for, you know, this weekend or anything. No, the offense is going to be great. Yeah. I hate to say it because I'm so used to the Colts being on top. The Jags are a dumpster fire. The Titans are a dumpster fire. When when it comes to the offense, I know the Titans were one win away from making the playoffs, but let's be honest, they weren't going to do anything anyway. Right. <laughs> and then the Colts obviously taking down the Texans. Uh, they're going to be good, though. I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, clear stud. They're going to have Dante Foreman back, still have Lamar Miller, probably still going to have Alfred Blue. I don't think they're going to get rid of him, but Cutie and Will Fuller as well. I mean, this there's a lot of potential in Houston. Yeah. Yep, and I just I just know that this is going to be your touchdown maker because it seems like that guy likes to hit, like Deshaun Watson likes to hit the slot, right? And this guy comes out of the slot. It's I think it's going to be something magical. I think it's going to be something that you're going to be able to get, and not super late, but you'll be able to get them later than, you know, most of the, like definitely more than the other Texans. Yep, absolutely. And last but not least. Leonard Fournette sucks. Don't forget this <laughs> next year. Leonard Fournette's an injury risk. He's he's just terrible. And I know reports just came out today talking about how they had a good meeting with Leonard Fournette and things are looking good for 2019. Leonard Fournette's a beast. Leonard Fournette is a stud. Leonard Fournette is a jaguar. And therefore, he's a dud. <laughs> He had the third lowest yards per carry this season out of qualifying running backs. Now, I know yards per carry is a very, very biased stat. It's not a good stat to use when you're talking about running backs. I think it's much more indicative of the offensive line than it is the running back. But we thought Leonard Fournette was basically matchup proof and offensive line proof. He's not. Yeah. Nope. He He's definitely susceptible to a stacked box. He's... He's just not that good. Not that he's not that good. I'm just really upset because he killed me in like five fantasy leagues. He's just, he's not on a good team. He's not in a good situation. That team is almost to the point where they're going to have to rebuild. I mean, they, their number one receiver is D.D. Westbrook, for God's sake. Yeah. 
So don't draft Leonard Fournette next year. Remember this, it, people. Remember this. Called it about DD, by the way. Said he was going to be the number one, and he yeah. was. I was all over Keeling. Man, Cole. everybody Man, was. Everybody was. I mean, he looked so good at the end of last season that you couldn't, you just couldn't forget that. And that this would have been, he would have made it on this show. It, it would have been, hey, remember Keelan Cole? He's amazing. He's so fast and he's so involved in this offense. And he, man, wow, talk about a flop. And he I, he had that big blow-up week, like week two or week three of this season, I think. Well, I can't remember exactly what week it was, but that big blow-up week. And then I was making the rankings. because So the rankings this year were created. It was a combination of mine, yours, and Prophet Hoos' rankings that we, all, we put all together to make the sleeper wire rankings. And you guys both had Keelan Cole ranked in your top 10. And I was like, you guys are insane because he was out of my top 30. <laughs> and then the next week he finished like in the 60s. Right. Yep. I mean, just terrible. But the whole fantasy community had him ranked as a wide receiver one that week. Yep. I mean, fantasy pros, his consensus was like the number 11. Yeah. I mean, he was just, he was so good at the end of the season. Like in Blake Bortles, he just, you know how Blake Bortles always does his little fantasy trick where he sucks for a week, does good for a week, sucks for a week, does good for a week. You know, always, oh, yeah. always opposite of when he's on your bench and on your in your lineup. But this it's called year, bordling. He, yeah, bordling, exactly. And this year, he just didn't do that. This year, Bortles was just trash, absolute trash the whole entire season. And it doesn't look like they're making any moves. So here we go again next year. So just remember that Leonard Fournette is trash. Dalvin Cook... <laughs> <laughs> almost the same exact guy, right? He carries the same kind of injury risk. He's, He's much better. But he is so much better. I'm not going to draft him before the third next year because of that little injury tag. But I think if you can get this guy later than the third, he's going to have insane value next year because he's so talented. I feel like Minnesota had a really bad year this year. I think they can take this offseason and put it back together. You had Thielen that lit it up, Diggs that lit it up, but I think we can get more. Kyle Rudolph was quiet, but I think Dalvin Cook that was, is still a good That guy. was my biggest miss of the season was Rudolph. Yeah, wow. I mean, that guy, Kirk Cousins loves his tight end. He loved his tight end for years. Yeah, yeah, three straight seasons in Washington where he threw to his tight ends more than his wide receiver won, and Kyle Rudolph is only a couple seasons removed from finishing as the tight end two on the season. So I was like, ah, oh, Rudolph is going to be top five. I'm getting him in the eighth round. That's great. And then, like, what, two good games whole season? Yeah, just two. He went, went like, 11 games without a touchdown. Right, and I mean, like, what was it, week 15 or 16, I think that he just went ham bananas, put up, like, 34 yeah. points or something like that. Seven for 100 plus and two. But if you had him in your lineup, man, you have a crystal ball in front of you because he did not do that for you all season long. No, he didn't. All right, you ready to get to a couple commissioner questions here from some listeners? Yes, I am. All right. So this first one is an issue that happened for the playoffs in his season this past year, in the 2018 season. If there is a contradiction in the rules about playoffs and seeding, so I'm talking about seeding in like the way it's set up in the platform, like ESPN or Yahoo or something like that, if there's a contradiction in the rules, but the way it's set up is different, what should the commissioner do to alleviate the problem? The issue was brought to the commissioner's attention after the regular season and before the playoffs started. Which teams were in the playoffs as well as seeding were both affected? What do you go by? Do you go by what the platform says or do you go by what the rules stated at the beginning of the season? Uh, to me, you got to go by the rules – at the beginning of the season, right? That's what everybody had the expectation of going into it to me. So for me, that's the rule that would I would yield to as a commissioner. Yeah, I 100% agree. If it was in the rules and everybody agreed to it before the season, it's the commissioner's fault for not making that change in the league before the season started. But at the same time, if that's what the rule was, you have to follow that because people didn't agree to play by, you know, the default in ESPN or Yahoo or Sleeper or whatever it was. They didn't agree to play with the default. They agreed to play with the rules that were set. Right. 
Yep. So to me, that that would be the default. Yep. That's what you got to do. So it sucks that, that happened, but you got to default to the rules. All right. And then Goodrench, we only got two of them. Goodrench12 says, what are some ways to make a redraft league more on skill and less on luck? And then also any draft position ideas. So more on skill and less on luck. I'm going to field this one first and mock, 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 right? You got a mock draft. We do. Uh, we do a lot of our mocks on Fantasy Football Calculator. We do a lot of mocks on Sleeper as well. Once it gets closer to the season, we have model mo- <laughs> uh, metal mock Mondays where we it's you know it's a live mock draft show where we we got a couple different mock drafts going at once. We're listening to metal, uh, so you guys can tune in. It's 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 a lot of fun because you know, I'm a big metal head. It's a lot of fun for me. A lot of fun to mock with all of you guys. But mocking is definitely the best way to go. When it comes to school, I mean, fantasy football, Mike, you know this, like, there's a ton of luck involved, right? Especially bad luck with injuries. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you can even just have something as simple as this guy's girlfriend didn't text him back before the game. And now all, all that this guy is thinking about is this girl and not thinking about that football game. And he goes out there and throws you a complete dud. I mean, that's how random the experience and the circumstance can be. So... You can try to set yourself up in every single way, but I mean, there is no, I mean, if we could win every single week, guys, we'd all be millionaires sitting on yachts. We'd all be DraftKings uh, spokespersons <laughs> and things like that, right? I mean, if it was that easy to try to figure this stuff out, but it's hard. I mean, you've got so many different variables and circumstances going into every single factor into a game. I mean, you look at stuff, one thing I, this kind of should have made it in the things to remember is that when you're sitting there looking at, well, this is obviously a great matchup for this guy. X amount, you know, this, this team has given up this and this and this and this. While you're sitting there doing that, guess what else is happening? A defensive coordinator is sitting down there going, man, I have got to figure out how to stop this guy. So they, they do everything they can just to isolate that one guy from doing anything in fantasy or doing anything in the game, it doesn't matter who else gets the production out of the deal. So that's always something to look at. If it looks too good to be true, it probably is play somebody else. That's something I learned this year. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> mocking is probably the best way that you can prep for it. But when it comes to more on skill and less on luck, like, like I said, there's a ton of luck involved. But – you know, listening to podcasts, reading articles, doing your own research, digging into stats. I mean, hey, you you got any other ideas? I think, you know, honestly, mock drafting is the best way to go about it if you want to think of it based on skill. Do a ton of them. Do them every day. Right. Another yep. just quick angle that I think a guy could take is get involved in a few IDP leagues, Right to where you're really paying attention to the defensive players because a lot of times these guys are shut down players without a name, you know? You go out there and you don't even know who the heck this guy is, but he's allowed one touchdown all season long. You know, things like that can happen. So getting involved in IDP really, to me, can stack the deck in your favor if you have a lot of people that don't understand defense. Yeah, 100% agree. Yep. And then he says also any draft position ideas. So my favorite way to go about picking a draft position is it's got to be in person. So not just pull names out of a hat or anything like that. But what we do is obviously we don't endorse this if you're under 21, but if you're over 21, (laughs) what I like to do is you draw names out of a hat first Then you've got beer pong set up, like just one side of beer pong with the 10 cups, full beer in each one. The bottom of the cup has numbers 1 through 10. If it's a 10-person league, you're 1 through 12, and then you'll have 12 cups stacked uh, some creative way or something like that. But you throw the ping pong ball in the order that your name was drawn. If you make it, you chug that beer, and whatever number is at the bottom, that's the pick you have in the draft. If you miss it, you go back to the back of the line. Oh, and then man. so on. So so it adds in that it's skill because you got to make it. But at the same time, there's a lot of luck involved. So it's not like you have to. It's not like Madden where you have to be really good at Madden if you want the number one pick or anything like that. There is a ton of luck involved, but it makes it more fun. Everybody gets a little bit to drink and has a nice little buzz going into the draft. You know, it just 
makes it fun. That's how I like to do it. Yeah, see, and the way we do it uh, down here is, like, we'll pick certain sporting events, right, that aren't football. Kind of in the middle of the season, just all of a sudden the commission will text and say, hey, it's going to be this baseball game, pick the score. You know, or pick the winner, pick the score. And whoever picks the winner goes into one bracket, and then you go by score, and that's your first pick. Or this year what we did was uh, pick a golfer. Like, and so in a master's round, I believe, I don't, I don't know anything about golf. I do know I watched Kopka <laughs> win, whatever it was, because I had Kopka as my guy. Cause my brother-in-law said, I think that guy's going to win it. And I'm like, cool. I'm picking him. And that's how much thought went into that. But I don't know. It's always kind of fun. Like uh, the year before that was the Floyd Mayweather fight. Like what round is he going to win in or, you know, what round, who wins, things like that. So there's a lot of different interesting ways you can set up draft order. Yeah, certainly. I like also uh, doing it based off video games that don't take skill. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's that's fun as well. All right. Uh, I guess one last question here. Wilson27, it's not a commissioner question, but he says, will league winners from the Pro-Am get an automatic entry back to next year? And I'm going to give that a solid yes. Yes. I if you it. won your league, you do get to come back next year. Yep. No matter what. You yep. you dance with the pros. You beat the pros. You're a pro. There you go. All right. So I just want to talk a, a little bit here about where some guys finish, and we'll go position by position. These are PPR finishes. So, Mike, I'm going to ask these to you. We already talked about how Mahomes and Matt Ryan, they were the one and two when it comes to quarterbacks. Who do you think was the three, four, and five? Ooh, that is tough. I would say. And you can, you don't have to put them in any specific order. Just give me three names that you think could finish in the top five. Okay, so Phillip Rivers, Ben Roethlisberger. And Drew Brees? One for three. Oh. Ben Roethlisberger was number three on the season. I'm looking at just plain ESPN default scoring. Okay. Roethlisberger was three. Drew Brees was eight. Oh, wow. And Phillip Rivers was the quarterback 11. Wow. Yeah. I quarterback so 11 for Rivers. I was a little shocked when I read that stat. Right. Yeah. So the three, the four and five, Deshaun Watson was number four, which is very close to what he was being drafted as. He was being drafted as the second or third quarterback off the board. For the most part, it went Aaron Rodgers and then some form of Watson and Wentz. That's what I saw in a lot of leagues. But Watson was number four, and Andrew Luck was the QB five. Oh, I forgot about Luck. That's who I was thinking of, too. I almost said Deshaun Watson, though, for what it's worth. But I definitely yep. never remembered Luck. Kirk Cousins finished as the quarterback what? 23. 12. Oh, wow. <laughs> quarterback 12, those 30 touchdowns. Oh, wow. He still finished as a quarterback one, huh? Right at the tail end yep. of it. Jeez, Kirk Cousins, you son of a gun. Tom Brady was the QB. 17? 14. Ooh. Close. Yeah, finished as a QB two. Which quarterback led the league in rushing yards? Josh Allen. Let me vet that because he's not on the list. It is not Josh Allen. Wow. That he was second. Me. Wow. He did have the most touchdowns, the most rushing touchdowns. But when it came to rushing yards, Lamar Jackson. Oh, wow. That's I mean, 695. That, that doesn't shock me. I just thought that. Him and Josh Allen started about the same time after Josh Allen's injury and things like that, and I thought he was out rushing him. So that doesn't surprise me, though. No, Allen was great on the ground. Yeah, well, as was Lamar Jackson. He can't do any – like, he talk about, you know, everybody sits there and says Josh Allen can't pass. Wow, Lamar Jackson, he's got a lot to work on this offseason. Yeah, it's not like Lamar Jackson can't pass. He just doesn't right. either. Right. Yeah, it was it was very strange. Who threw the most interceptions? Nate Peterman. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> In one half. Uh, Andy Dalton? Not Andy Dalton. Dalton didn't play uh, the whole season. Yeah, I still figured I'd have a pretty good shot on that. <laughs> uh, it's a veteran. Threw more than 5,000 yards. Threw more than 30 touchdowns. 
Is it Philip Rivers? It is not Rivers. This quarterback led the league in passing attempts. It's Ben Roethlisberger with 16 say, interceptions. Wow, that is that is crazy. That's yep. also crazy. 16 interceptions is what led it. It's typically a little higher than that, but but man, yeah, yeah. 16 picks. Yeah, wow. That Steelers team, they're in trouble. That that is a team that is going to need a lot of work in this offseason. Let's move to running backs. Like I said before, keeping it in PPR scoring. Okay. Todd Gurley. How many touchdowns did he have on the season? 18. Close. 21. 21. 17 on the ground and four through the air. But with his 18 touchdowns, not 18, with his 21 touchdowns, he still finished as the RB3. What two running backs finished ahead of him? Saquon Barkley and that's tough i'm trying to think of who who was it? was it alvin kamara kamara was right behind Gurley at number four. Oh, okay so saquon barkley's correct though right saquon barkley was the number one yep is it lamar Miller? i'll give you another hint he had over a thousand yards he had the most receiving yards by a running back and broke the running back reception record for a single season. Christian McCaffrey, Christian 107 McCaffrey. catches. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? And Barkley as a rookie caught 91. Right. Barkley. Just man. insane. Insane. Uh, which running back? So Gurley had the most rushing touchdowns at 17. Who had the second most rushing touchdowns? And I guess technically the second most total touchdowns. Was it Connor? Connor was third in Connor. rushing, tied for third with Derrick Henry. Ooh, I'm trying to think of who else was out there scoring. You give up? Yeah. Alvin Kamara, fourteen rushing oh, touchdowns. Said Alvin Kamara too. Damn it! Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, let's see. James White finished as the RB what? 14. Cut that in half. Wow, seven? Really? James White was the number seven running back in PPR scoring. Yep, there was the 87 catches and seven receiving, er, yeah, seven receiving touchdowns. I mean, there was a time there where he was just putting them up like crazy, but I think recency bias made me forget about that guy right because they yep. just were not using him at the end of the season that's what it was he put up most of that in the first 12 games or so but he did have the second most receiving yards after christian mccaffrey's 867 white had 751 wow a lot more involved mm -hmm. than i remember him being yeah absolutely yep he was a monster uh david johnson was the rb what Ooh, i'm gonna guess like uh, 10 Close. He was the RB9. Okay. Yep. I, I know he did a lot better than people thought he did, too. Like one of those guys. Yeah, just just people were just games. drafting him as, you know, a, a top three guy, and that didn't pan out. Right, and I think that has a lot to do with coaching as well. Coaching and yep. the quarterback situation. I mean, Sam Bradford, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty ridiculous. Uh, Tariq Cohen, RB what? Uh, I would guess I think he's I think he made one eleven. Yeah, he was the RB eleven. Nice. What about Kareem Hunt? Sixteen. RB twelve. Twelve. I he knew was he was that still... good. Yeah. Wow. He was that good. Uh, last one here: the RB five and the RB six. That leap from five to six. How many points do you think it was between the fifth and sixth person? 24. 49.1. I thought I figured it was going to be high. Zeke at fifth was 329.1, and Connor at six was 280. Wow. Yeah, big jump between those two right there. In fact, James White was only 3.4 away from being the number six. Oh, my goodness sakes. Yeah, a little ridiculous. That is. Let's move to wide receivers. Antonio Brown was the wide receiver what? 14? Oh, come on. Give me a real answer for AB. I, I honestly thought he started. I thought he finished a <laughs> lot later. 
like a lot. No, nah, he was the he was the wide receiver five. Was he? Okay, like so not drafted there. Yeah, no, but I mean, I feel like he, uh, I just felt like he had a really off year this year. I mean, he had a couple two touchdown games, but it just wasn't the same old Antonio Brown scoring in bunches like he always does. True. Uh, but he did have 15 touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, but he put it on like <laughs> right there towards the end. And I just, I mean, I really just thought there was a lot of receivers that outdid him this year. Yeah, and what it really was was the yardage. I mean, he still had, what, nearly 1,300 yards, uh, 1,297. But the guys that were ahead of him, uh, in order from number one, Hill had 1,479, 1,572 for Hopkins, 1,386 for Adams, and then for Julio was 1,677. And really the top five from number one to number five, so from Tyreek Hill to Antonio Brown, was only, what is it, 10.3 – yeah, 10.3 points. Wow. That's pretty amazing so they were, right there. <laughs> yeah. They were all very, very close together. But it really was the yardage. Let's see. Adam Thielen or Mike Evans? Who had more receiving yards? I think Mike Evans turned it up towards the end. I think I'm going to say Mike Evans here. Yeah, Evans more than 1,500 yards, which is insane. It doesn't feel like Mike Evans was as good as he was. Right, yeah, see, and like I said, it feels like towards the end of the season for him, too, he was another one of those guys that turned it on late, like, just didn't do anything for the beginning, but then, bam, like, Ryan Fitzpatrick seems to avoid Mike Evans pretty well. I don't know, I thought Fitzpatrick targeted targeted him pretty well, but just maybe not towards the the last couple games of his career. Right. And I say career because I don't know if we'll ever see Fitz again. I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) uh same here let's move to our last position here tight ends all right so first stat here number one two and three you can probably tell me who those guys were right kelsey Ertz and who and ebron no cook Oh, no. sorry, Kittle. Dude, sorry, Kittle. <laughs> there Kittle. you go. Yeah, yeah sorry. Kittle was number three. Number four was Ebron, and he was actually a little more than 36 points behind Kittle. Right, yeah, Kittle. That's those right. those three lit it up this year. Yeah, for sure. Austin Hooper, the tight end what? Seven? Tight end six. Oh. Close. Who was the tight end seven? So it would be after Austin Hooper. I, that's, that's where Jared Cook, I think, fits in. He was five. Ooh. Kyle Rudolph was the tight end seven. See, and that just lets you know how abysmal the tight end position was this Uh, year. It was just horrid this year. (laughs) Just horrid. And to everybody who drafted Jimmy Graham as the tight end five, I would like to give you another fat I told you so. (laughs) <laughs> just Aaron Rodgers does not use his tight ends and where where you heard this now for three straight seasons it's like, oh Rodgers has never had a tight end like Jared Cook oh Rodgers has never had a tight end like uh, who do they have last year Martellus Bennett he's never had a tight end like Jimmy Graham face it he doesn't use them right that's it it, it did seem that like he was it. trying a little bit this year but never just they never got a groove together and I mean if you're not going to get it with Jimmy Graham, you're just that's not going to be your philosophy. I'm with you 100%. Yeah. Two touchdowns for Jimmy Graham all season. Now, granted, I don't think he played every game. I think he missed. Actually, no, he did play every game. Yeah, Graham played every single game, only two touchdowns on the season. And it looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six games with double-digit points in PPR. Really bad. Yeah, that's just <laughs> dreadful. That is, yeah, dreadful. Great way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, let's do let's kickers here. Who was the number one kicker on the season? Ooh, that is tough because I didn't pay attention. Uh, just, or no. Um, yeah, Justin Tucker. I think Justin Tucker. He was finished. number two. Number one, Kaimi Fairbairn. Oh, okay. Yep, for Houston. Yep. Killed it towards the end of the season. He did, yeah. But he, we, we don't need to talk about kickers. Right, because <laughs> we're going to try to boycott kickers in this off season. That's something we're moving yeah. towards. <laughs> Last one. Who was the number one overall scorer in fantasy football? Uh, Patrick Mahomes? It was Mahomes. By a wide margin. Was it? Yeah, he beat Saquon Barkley by about 32 points. Oh. Which is weird because the last two seasons, a running back has been the top spot. It was David Johnson and then Todd Gurley. 
that was before the Michael Jordan of football stepped on the field, <laughs> <What Chris. ever>? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe Michael Jordan is now the Pat Mahomes of basketball. Ooh, ooh, that's a better twist. Hashtag the goat. The goat. <laughs> he, he has potential, man. That guy looked really, really good this season. I can't wait to see what he's got in him throughout the rest of the playoffs. It's going to be fun for sure. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for the first show of the 2019 season. Thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Check out our website, sleeperwire.com. You can follow us on Twitter at sleeperwire show. Mike is on there. Dirty jobs, uh, 21, if I believe, right? Correct. And then I am on there at prof underscore Chris SW. And then you can also find us on the sleeper app. Professor Chris and Dirty Jobs. And then, Mike, you're on Instagram posting all your dirty jobs, aren't you? Absolutely. Anytime I can get away with keep these nasty things out there, I set them out there. Yeah, guys, follow him. Are you Dirty Jobs on Instagram, too? Yes, I am. Yep, follow Mike on Instagram. It is disgusting. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you guys next time.